So today we're going to talk about uh, authorization Hasura and look at few interesting use cases. Uh, we, we won't touch like some of the basics. Uh, recommend you to check the docs and uh, uh, look at a few sample apps uh, for some of the basics. Uh, this kind of is going to be a little bit of a medium level use cases, somewhat complicated in nature. And uh, you, if you've used Hasura just, just for basic uh, basic things, you, you may not have discovered these yet, uh, but these show up and uh, in interesting places and you, you can dynamically like you can you can use these to perform a lot of interesting things that that may not be obvious at first covering few conceptual grounds before we look at the use cases uh, so authorization hasura is uh, is an a back system right it's attribute based access control uh, that doesn't mean that it's uh, you might have heard of role role based access control so a back is like a superset of that and in, in a lot of places uh, in Hasura docs and in the, in the ways that you've used Hasura, you might you might have come across the, the term roles a lot more. Uh, but from a, a security modeling uh, literature, this authorization Hasura is ABAC, right? And this reference in the docs as well, as you can see it's being shot at the bottom. Uh, so what attributes do we have? So we have something called a role and session variables, right? Uh, we'll see how these are used uh, uh, in, in the examples. Uh, and another important thing is that Hasura architecturally also publishes role-based schemas. Right? What what that means is that for every role that you define, right, and uh, and you give those roles certain permissions, and that's going to generate a completely new schema uh, that that you can then query against. Right. So if you have like five uh, different roles, conceptually you have like five different schemas uh, in Hasura, and then uh, when when you're making a query with that role, you're hitting that schema. So that's a very interesting architecture, and I think uh, uh, it leads to some very interesting properties in terms of like uh, in 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 terms of understanding what permissions you have, right? Because you can clearly see what the schema is, and the, and for each role, it's going to be different, so you can see what differences in schemas also emerge because of your permissions and so on. Another architectural thing to note is that uh, the authorization execution itself happens through something called a push down mechanism where, uh, where all these rules are executed, not at the Hasra layer. They're, they are uh, defined at the Hasra layer. They are like a lot of processing happens there, but the actual core execution uh, application happens uh, at the source. Right, so if it's a Postgres database, it's, it's the the execution is going to happen in Postgres. There's some other database it's going to be that database, uh, and so on and so forth. If it's remote schemas, uh, which is very different from database engines, it still is going to be pushed down to the actual remote schema. And the way that we do that is by having permission rules, which which allow you to do that. Right, so uh, so that's very important to know in terms of in terms of the architecture and also like how it impacts performance, for example. The final thing is authorization is very different from authentication, right? Authentication kind of validates the user, uh, uh, verifies the claims and so on, or uh, and also like publishes like what attributes they have, right? What what permissions they, they have. But you have to, uh, uh, so authorization is one level after that where you kind of use that to actually execute some of your permissions and uh uh your your security rules right so hustler does not take an opinion on that you there are two different ways to add uh, uh authentication hustler webhook and jwt both are fairly generic right so you can bring in any custom like you can bring in any authorization uh, authentication provider that could be auth0 firebase uh, uh cognito uh octa right and if you have something very custom, you have you, if you work uh, inside inside an enterprise and you have your own thing, uh, then there's always the webhook mode, which which is basically like a generic wrapper uh, uh, that you can call and you can get the you can get you can do the validation and the verification there, and get the attributes that Hasra needs uh, into Hasra, right? 
so uh, another thing is that we also like easily provide uh, a way to map your existing authentication to uh, to to these ses these session variables or attributes through things like custom mappings so you can just configure your authentication to actually map these certain things for example in your authentication token right if uh, if uh, if something like user id is present in a field called id but you want that to be used as x hasura user id because that's what hasura understands then you can actually configure that directly in hasura in, in the environment variable for for authentication uh, you don't have to write any extra code for that right yeah, so this is this is basically a very uh, quick rundown of uh, the conceptual architectural framework of uh, how we look at authorization. And and now we'll just start with one warm up example, which is the simplest example, and I'm sure most of you would have seen this already. But for those who are very new to Hasra, uh, this will serve as uh, as a warm up, and then we look at more complicated cases. Uh, so suppose I have a table called user, which is what the screenshot shows, and I have uh, some rows here, right? Uh, and uh, I want to basically fetch only my data, right? And that's defined by some maybe something like my user ID, right? Which is which is defined by this col uh, column here called ID. So what I can do is create a permission. Uh, I can create a role called user, which is here at the top. It could be any name. Right, and I can choose uh, for select action. I can basically define the permission. Right, the permission. There are different types of permissions. So the first one here is uh, basically a row select permission, which means like what kind of roles, uh, what kind of rows can this role select, and that's given by this permission, which says ID should be equal to X extra user ID. Right, as simple as that, and the. At the bottom here, you can also see like what the column select permissions are, like what all columns can I choose? So here I've chosen all. Uh, so yeah, so you basically define that uh, when you're querying, when you're querying with this rule, it is going to run this permission where it's only going to, for selects, it's only going to retrieve rows for which ID is equal to access rate, right? right? And if I do that, uh, and uh, here's, a, here's an example of that, if I do that, like for example, I have explicitly become accessor role user here, and I've explicitly given accessor user ID as two here, right? I can do this uh, in in graphical by giving the accessor admin secret. So this is a nice way to like emulate roles and so on. So uh, that's what I'm using. But ideally, you you will obviously not give extra accessor admin secret when you're making your request. You'll be giving authentication token based on how you have integrated your authentication provider, right? And that will in turn have these things inside it, right? Uh, but right now I'm explicitly providing these as headers, which I can do if I have access to it. It's useful for local dev, right? So here, uh, yeah, so I make this query and uh, I can see that uh, the user ID is two uh, and I only get the one row, uh, which corresponds to ID equal to two. Right. In the table, we saw two rows, but we, uh, and this query does not specify any filters, does not have anything hidden, right? Uh, but the permissions are getting applied because the role is user. So yeah, that's uh, that's the simplest example. Uh, here, uh, you, you saw like how roles are created, like the concept of roles, concept of permissions, and how that gets executed uh, when you actually run a query. So now, uh, yeah. So so now we start the real real uh, agenda of of uh, of the session, which is looking at few interesting patterns. The first one is uh, enforcing checks against data in different table, right? Uh, 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 if if you've already seen few of these operators, column equality, column not equal, CGTs, column greater than, and so on. Uh, these are uh, very interest. These are very useful uh, op operators, and in till version two, like before version two, actually, uh, we supported these operators only only on the same table, right? But version two onwards, we've actually in, uh, enhanced that, and you can do column comparison across different tables now, right? And uh, this is the syntax. 
it might be a little bit abstract. So we'll look at an example uh, uh, in the next slide. Uh, but the, the core idea is that in the previous simple example, we saw that you could run a check against uh, a column with the session variable. We said ID should be equal to access to user ID, right? Uh, but now you could actually do comparisons against columns again in different tables. Uh, to, uh, to give you an example, we're going to build a shopping cart, right? We're going to model a shopping cart and what permissions it should have. Uh, a shopping cart is basically some, some place where you can add a few items and those items are only valid if, uh, if they are present in the inventory, right? So here I have two tables, shopping cart and inventory and, uh, shopping cart has a relationship with, uh, uh, has a relationship with inventory. And the, the check that I'm running here is that, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll also show the tables here quickly. Uh, yeah, so inventory has like for each item, it also has a stock, right? Uh, like how much is available right now in, in the inventory, right? Uh, and shopping cart has the user ID, the item ID and the quantity, like how much does, does the user user want to add that item? Right. And this item ID is, has a relationship with inventory, right? That's an obvious relationship between shopping cart and uh, inventory. Yeah. So coming back here, uh, you slide show. Yeah. So I, I want to run a custom check. Uh, whenever, uh, like I choose like an item and give some quantity to, for that, I want to make sure that that shopping cart is created only if, uh, the stock in the inventory is greater than, uh, the quantity in the shopping cart. Right. Uh, yeah. So to see how that works in action, if I basically insert a shopping cart, I'm going to create a shopping cart. I've put the ID, uh, the item ID here. Right. I've said quantity is 11 and the user ID is one. I mean, these are just sample inputs. User ID could probably be preset as well, but here I'm just explicitly giving that, I guess you wouldn't do that in, in an actual application. You will actually preset that and set that to something which is coming from the token. Uh, but anyway, so the quantity is 11. And, uh, if, if you note, if you noted, uh, in, in the inventory, uh, in the inventory table that I showed earlier, uh, the stock value was 10, right? So this is actually uh, higher than that. And that's why if you execute this, you're going to get a permission error, right? Uh, not not the most verbose, uh, I mean, it requires deciphering, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you should probably uh, parse this to give very good, a much better uh, error response to users. But yeah, so the permission check is kicking in because the quantity here is 11. And if the quantity is lower than 10, like nine, then it's going to go through and your shopping cart is going to be uh, created, right? So this was the first pattern. Uh, uh, wanted to call this out because we recently enhanced an existing thing uh, to span across different tables. Uh, pattern number two here is, uh, uh, is slightly specific to Hasura's implementation of GraphQL. So I wouldn't call this a, a, a pattern in a very broad sense of a, a application pattern or a security pattern, but it's still very useful to know. Uh, so if, if you create, uh, if you create like a role called public, right. And you want to give, give it like open access to all rows, but you want to only show ID and name for those rows and not email which is what I've, I've deselected email here. So you can see everyone's ID and name, right? That's what public role does. Uh, so yeah, so you can query with role public, you can query the ID and name and you get that back. You get both the rows now, right? Uh, but if I also queried email, right? It's going to throw a validation failure because the email uh, field was not even added to the schema. And remember going back to the very first slide, I said, as role-based schemas, and this is an example of that, 
uh, that because your permission did not allow for the email column, it does not even surface in the schema for the role public and you're going to get a validation failure. Uh, this is slightly annoying because now, depending on the role, you have to construct like specific queries, right? For example, if, if I, if I actually, I want to be a user role and I want to get ID name and email, uh, for my data, right. Uh, then I have to write a query for, for that. Uh, it'll have three fields and for other things, uh, for the public things for I, for ID name for other, other folks, or other rows, uh, I will have to generate a different query. So this is kind, kind of annoying and, uh, this is by design, but what we can do is instead of e like email throwing a validation failure email, we could actually return email to be null for all these users. Right. And that would, that would be equally good, uh, because you're not, you're not losing any data and you have a very specific, like you have, a, you have a generic, uh, query and you can use it across different roles. So how do we do that? How do we turn this validation error to return null, which has been a common thing we have seen, uh, many users ask, uh, is by actually creating a dummy role, which I've called nuller here. So dummy role, because if you look at the custom check here, I've set ID less than zero. You could, you could basically put any custom check here, which does not return any rows. I, I have a database con constraint or my modeling of my application enforces that IDs are always like greater than zero. Uh, but I have created a role, which is checking if ID is less than zero. So it's always going to return an empty, empty set, but I have selected all the columns here, right? ID, email, and name. Uh, so it's, it's going to have these. So, so this role is going to have all these three fields, but it's not going to return any row, any like ever. And if you're not aware of inherited roles, Asura has inherited roles where you can combine different roles together. And there is a specification of how that gets combined. Uh, and, uh, so what will happen actually is that I've created a role called public enhanced, which is a combination of nuller and public. And what it's going to do is it's going to combine the row, row permissions and column permissions. And you can now query ID name and email, and it's going to return email as null and, uh, uh email as null for both those fields, right? So select permission get kicks, kicks in, uh, and the column permission also kicks in, right? So that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a interesting. And I think, uh, uh, if you really need this, then it's, it's a nice way to get this behavior. Uh, right. The third thing, uh, is, uh, is like when you think of attributes, you probably think of attributes in the sense that it, it is kind of static. It belongs to, uh, it belongs to the bearer. It belongs to maybe the user, right? But it need not be like that. For example, uh, we had a use case where we want to insert into a table. If an existing record defined by say a username, right. is older than 60 days. So that's, that's a very interesting use case. Uh, 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 and the way that you can do that in Hasura uh, is by actually adding another uh, another attribute, like another session variable called XHasura timestamp. Right? It could be it, I've just named it timestamp. But the modeling here is pretty pretty neat, where you can actually say that insert, and this is a not here, so it's going to negate whatever is inside. So you're going to check. If there is, uh, so ex there's exists here, which is basically going to check if there exists some row, which satisfies this where condition in this table, right? So for example, for public, uh, in, in, in the test table, you want to check if there's a name, which is equal to access for username, right? With a timestamp. Uh, so every row will have a timestamp, the timestamp, which is greater than access for a timestamp, right? So what is accessory time step? Like you can imagine, like you, you probably going to set something which is current date minus 60, 60 days, right? Uh, 
uh, and this this is something that you can calculate on on the on the client side if you want. It, it's something that you can calculate at at the webhook side. Uh, depends on like how much how much flexibility you want in in, in this uh, this header, right? And uh, yeah, so basically, it's going it's going to do this. It's now dynamic, right? Because access to timestamp is going to change uh, every time, and then you use that to check whether such a row exists. And if it does not exist, then you let the insert go through, right? So basically, yeah. So many, many at many places we have seen that uh, it's not obvious like what at like what if we, what attributes a user should have. You can be as creative as you want, right? Depends on your use case. Uh, the final thing, this is the, this is the last one I have, uh, is modeling dynamic roles, right? So roles in Hasura is a, is a, uh, is a Hasura specific concept, right? Uh, but maybe you have an application where you have, you, it's like a, it's an application like Reddit, right? Where you have different groups, users can join those groups with different privileges. Like for example, somebody could be a viewer, somebody could be an editor, somebody could be an admin, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense if your application is inherently creating a lot of roles, it doesn't make sense for you to create a Hasura role for each of those things, because that's going to be very dynamic. You're going to be changing the metadata too often and so on. So you're going to model that in the application level itself, right? And the way that you can do that, uh, I've set an example here is, for example, you can have a table called group permissions, which has a group ID, user ID, so that you can know which like which user belongs to which group and the role a column called role a text column which defines what role uh, they should have in that group right and uh, yeah so for example uh, here uh, in group id user id 1 is creator uh, user id uh, 2 in the same group is an admin and uh, yeah user id 3 is an admin for group 2 you can fairly fairly straightforward modeling of roles for each user and group. And uh, suppose uh, you wanted to have a comments uh, table, right? And you wanted the creator to obviously create and update their comment, but you also wanted say an admin uh, to update other, other folks, uh, other users comments if they're in the same group of which they are the admin of. So you can basically use something like exists. We saw a preview of that in the earlier uh, use case as well. Uh, but yeah, exists is a is a very powerful feature where it kind of decouples uh, it kind of decouples your tables permissions, right? It's not tied to specifically your table itself. Exists can basically reference any other unrelated table or anything actually, right? So yeah, that's what we. we we are going to be doing here in in some sense what i mean at a high level what we are doing here is that we are checking the group permissions table on comments we are checking the group permissions table for a user id which is equal to accessor user id coming from a token and the role should be in creator or admin right and some a little bit of cut off here with but it actually goes through that goes through a relationship so that the group id is inherent uh in the in the uh in, in the actual execution Right, so you're just checking for access to user ID and if the role is these two roles. So yeah, so basically uh, you can create dynamic roles if that's your application and uh, you can model them uh, however you want by using exists and some of these other operators that we saw. Uh, yeah, that's all I had uh, back to you, Jesse. Thanks, Tiru. That is was a fantastic presentation because this is really one of the, the magical parts of Hasura to really get that right. And I just wanted to stress too, that is Hasura layering metadata on top of your existing database. So you're able to get these permissions and controls without modifying the underlying data structures, which is a really critical concept there. So you can take an existing database, get very secure uh, lockdown and, and creative controls on that without actually modifying underlying data. So really a fast, uh, just a fantastic talk and presentation. And there's so much to dig into each of those topics. So if that's something you would even like on a workshop level or something to have a much more deep dive on, let us know and we can try to arrange to have that happen. Cause this really is one of the, the power features of Hasura to be able to uh, really unlock what you can do with this product. So 
Super cool. Also, one quick throw out. Uh, when I learned about the fallback strategy there for the ID of zero, that was really cool. Um, if you're into that space and you have a problem with you know different roles having different access to fields, also have a checkout with Fluent GraphQL clients. That's another way where you can do uh, conditional querying of fields at runtime. So if that's something that you're into or having a problem with, I just want to do a quick. Thing.